I think all conferences should be organized with, within biking distance of my house. Right? <laughs> all right, so, oops, there we go. What happened? All right, um, so I'm gonna start my talk with a question. It sounds like a discussion table question. Uh, what's wrong with this picture? Of course, one, one thing that's wrong is the font is too small, but um, um, so many of you will have your own answers to this. Um, uh, my answer is that this looks very machine learning-ish without anything else, no other context. So uh, this is federated learning. It's a problem of imagining you want to build a big central model and you don't have enough data and data be, can't be captured all in one place. So you go out to the edge and you uh, flow all the data in and you worry about the bit rate and the streaming and you worry about just sending you know, mask gradients and, and so on. So a very computer science perspective. Um, but in real life, there's a whole economic model that's implicit here, that's not being made explicit, okay? About, well, who has this data? What value do they have in the data? What, what problem is being solved? The implicit assumption is that the building the big central model is gonna be good for everybody, but that's implicit. Um, why should I care to participate? And even if I do care, maybe someone else sitting next to me is sending similar data to me, why can't I just free ride off of them and not have to worry about privacy issues? And so on and so forth. All right, so there's all these implicit economic problems that aren't even being faced at all or, or formalized in, in any language. Okay, so in real life, these nodes are often people, not always, or, or organizations, and their data just can't be thought in terms of bits, okay? There's values associated with the data, and yes, privacy is an issue and you want to protect it in this model in some sense not, has a nod in the direction of privacy because things are held at the nodes and not everything is sent centrally. Uh, but that's too weak for me. Um, and moreover, privacy is something I may want to trade off. I might want to give more data if I get more value out of the overall exercise. If you're studying a disease that runs in my family and building a central model of cancer, you know, I'm all in. And if, you know, for other purposes, maybe not. And I want some control over all of that. All right. Uh, moreover, you know, computer science has always, or often, in my generation at least, have been about connecting people. And then, you know, Zuckerberg made that into a, uh, a business model. Uh, but that's really not enough. And I think people in this room are very, very aware of that. Okay, so people often value their data. Data is a good. Um, it's not just something to be streamed. And they may want to reveal aspects of their data if they get commensurate benefits. So that's more of an economics perspective. All right, so one of the tenor uh, of this talk is that uh, machine learning people really know precious little economics of any kind, whether old-fashioned kind or Glenn-style economics. Um, and, but economics people learn know precious little about learning and data. They assume everything, they, it's called, they call it Bayesian when you assume everything is already known. All right, so there are actually really simple opportunities to be brought by taking some of the you know, counterbalancing and building disciplines that kind of bring these two things together. It won't solve everything, but boy, it's kind of surprising how much you can do. All right, so here's a real world example. So I have teamed up with someone who's a friend of mine, uh, Steve Stout. He's a legendary hip hop artist or hip hop uh, producer, um, cultural figure, icon, uh, very smart person. Um, he's the CEO of a company called United Masters, and I'm on the board and been a scientific advisor. It's at the end of the day a market creating exercise. Um, and the observation was that music is completely broken these days. You would have thought that it's not at all. Everyone's, listening, everyone's making more music than ever before in history by a factor of 100, if you just look at the data. Um, and more, more listening is going on than ever before in history. Um, uh, so you'd think there's a flourishing ecosystem market, whatever you want to call it here, that people are making money and a lot of young people are empowered and all, and it's just not true. You know, there's a few people making billions and most other people are left out. Um, all right, so it, here's another fact, which is that if you look at the music listened to today um, in any city in the United States, 95% of it was made in the last six months and made by someone you never heard of, 95%. So we all think that everyone's listening to the Beatles or Beyonce and all, it's just not true. And who are these people making the music? Well, they're 16-year-olds, 18-year-olds, and 20-year-olds, mostly, okay? Um, and they just, this is what they do. And this is what they, you know, how they socialize. They share things. It's, it's really an important cultural thing. And you've got to respect that culture if you're going to kind of engage with it, all right? So the idea that Steve had, and that I helped him uh, execute, uh, was that think of the musicians not just as a source of bits. Nowadays, they stream their, they make a great song, they'll stream it to SoundCloud, 
you know, Spotify will grab it and they'll stream it to you and me and then Spotify wonders how to make some money. And they probably do a subscription or advertising based model and you all know where that goes. All right, so instead the first step here is just to make it a, really into a producer consumer sort of situation where each of the uh, artists, anybody who's making music, you or me, and let me just say there's already now about three million people who have signed up with United Masters, so this is not a small thing. Um, uh, if, if you're making music, at the end of the week you see a dashboard, which is like a map of, say, the United States, and you see a dot every time one of your songs is to listen to, and you can see that, oh my goodness, in you know, Akron, Ohio, I'm popular for who knows what reason, someone liked me, told their friends, and 10,000 people listen to my songs. So I say, hey, venue owners, notice that, you know, why don't you invite me? I'll go give a show, I'll make $20,000. I do that three times during a year, there's a salary. You're not Beyonce, you're not making billions, but there's a salary. And this is actually happening to this day. Now this is a multi-way market. Markets can be very creative, and Steve is a creative person, so he, knew, he, he knows the people in the NBA. He's friends with LeBron and so on. So he went to them and he signed a contract with the NBA. Used to be that when you would watch a clip of the NBA and you hear some music behind it, that was Beyonce or Kanye or whatever, and, and huge amounts of money was paid to those people. Um, now, uh, it's United Masters artists. You go there, you're going to hear something from a 16-year-old, and the 16-year-old's going to get paid, and that's happening in this moment. Two million people are actually getting salaries from these things. And it's, of course, a market. These people now know who's listening to them. Brands get interested. They actually start to give money to individual artists. The artists say, can I'll come play your, your daughter's wedding uh, because I know you like me, uh, $20,000, and, and so on. Okay, so this is happening right now. And this, so is this trivial? Well, obviously not. I wouldn't be bragging about it if it were. Um, it's not trivial. It's trivial. Not, not, it's not trivial. Both as a sociological phenomenon, but as and as a business model. But also behind this is actually data science, market making, machine learning meets economics. Okay, there was non-trivial to work all that out. Okay, um, this could be done for all kinds of learning aware markets, and and you know could be obviously done in Brazil, could be done in Africa, could be done in China but also could be done with other kind of goods that are information-based goods. You know, I could sell my knowledge about things. I could write articles, you know. So it's something like the creator economy, uh, and it's trying to make kind of a real technical field that supports that. Uh, the, the actual machine learning being used for market making, being used for in connecting people who have value to give to other people. Okay, so um, open problems, there's just tons of them. Um, these are, I'm a technical person, so I want to prove theorems and design algorithms and deploy them, and so here's just, uh, I'm not going to go through any of them. I just want to mention one of them on this slide, which is information asymmetries. Um, and so you've heard incentives today, there's a theory of it going back, you know, for hundreds of years in economics. Contract theory is one part of it, and auctions are the other. Auctions got grabbed by the technical people at Google and so on, and it became a money-making thing. Contracts are actually more interesting. And so you all kind of know what contracts are. On that slide, I said something about it. You know, uh, you can pay business class fare and you get this service, like a little glass of wine and a bigger seat, and you're happy to pay tons of money, so the airline gets money out of that. And if you're not interested in all that stupid service, you can go in the back and pay much, much less, and you're happy, everybody's happy, and there's the mathematics behind this. Again, it assumes that everything's known a priori, that there's distributions of all the people, and that's all known, and you design that. That's not true in many real life problems. So just let me give you an example of a great problem. The FDA tries to figure out what drugs go to market each year. That's a huge expense. Here is the cost for clinical trials last year in the United States. So tens of millions of dollars for you know, all the different kinds of diseases. Because you, know, you have to get 3,000 people and run the trial and so on and so forth. So, you, know, you all know about that for vaccines. All right, so the issue is that the FDA is trying to figure out what drugs to make a clinical trial and then there's gonna be false positives and, and so you gotta control all the errors here. Uh, and the whole problem is that where do the drug candidates come from? Well, they come from drug companies who have private information. Maybe this drug is maybe good, maybe it's not. They maybe know a little bit about that. But the FDA can't go to them and say, tell me if you're a candidate you're sending me is good or not. They're just hoping it'll leak through as a false positive and they'll make some money for some time. All right, so if you start to do mathematics with this, First of all, you can be a statistician and set up a test that has good type one error, type two error, and it could even be optimal, and they do this at the FDA. But now you can run it through some test cases. If it's a small profit situation, it might cost you $200 million to run the trial, and 20, uh, $200 million if, you, if, 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 if approved, and for some reason the font's weird there. But you can now calculate the expected profit if it's actually not a good drug, and it's minus 10 million. So the CEO will say to the, at the drug company, will not send any candidates unless you're really sure it's a good drug. Whereas if you could make uh, two billion, more like ibuprofen, 
right, then even if it's not a good drug, you're going to make 80 million um, uh, on expected value. So you'll sin in all your counts. And this is actually more of the regime that we're in in the real world. Okay, so this is contract theory. And again, the font has gotten messed up here. Um, Microsoft. Um. <laughs> but anyway, I'm not going to get that. There's a paper that we're starting with this. And uh, you, you write down the agent pays a reservation price and opts in. And then you get a menu of options, service and expense. And then there's in the middle right here, there's a statistical data is gathered. And at that point, there's some branching and you get results depending on the branching. Um, so it's a whole new field that needs to be done. And it could be again done with older economics or new economics um, and uh, modern machine learning. All right, so last little comment just to leave this slide for you to look at for a moment. These two fields are in primitive states, but if you look at them well, they are complementary faults in the two. And starting to bring them together and having that language in the middle between the, the technical side and the social side, um, I think is the agenda item for the next couple of decades. Thank you, Michael Jordan.